Hello, listeners. Beyond the Mask, in conjunction with NBC RNA, is pleased to announce that listening to our podcast can earn you Class B credits. For more information on how to submit them, go to our website. Beyond the Mask is made possible by the team at CRNA Financial Planning. With almost two decades of experience, the firm guides CRNAs through the complexities of investing and financial planning. Schedule a free consultation today by calling 855-304-3748 or go online to crnafinancialplanning.com. Now, on with the show. Welcome to Beyond the Mask, innovation and opportunities for CRNAs with Jeremy Stanley and Sharon Pierce. We know you spend your day caring for your patient's best interests. On our show, we want to care for you. Join us as we leave the operating room and learn the latest in the CRNA industry. Beyond the Mask starts in 10, 9, 8, 7, all right, Sharon. Well, it's good to be back again, and uh, got another wonderful episode lined up for us today. With our favorite two guests, of course. Yeah, of course. Welcome, Sandy and Nancy. Good to be here. Yeah, we, this is going to be a continuance of our historical series. And um, Sharon, who are we going to be talking about today? Goldie Brangman. You know, I really hate that we mm. missed that opportunity to interview her um, for more than one reason. I mean, one, the fact that it was in Hawaii would yes. have been great. Um, but, uh, you know, COVID hit and kind of cost us that opportunity. That would have been a great piece to the historical series. Yeah, and we couldn't do it the year before. They had asked us uh, the year before that, but we couldn't go because your national meeting yep. was during the same time. Yep, that's right. That's right. So. Well, I'm looking forward to learning more about Goldie. Obviously, a great woman, and two great women are going to tell us about her. So, let's learn a little bit more about Goldie. Who's going to start us off here? Nancy, All why right. don't you tell us about her education and early life at Harlem Hospital? Okay, well, Goldie was as was born in 1917 in Maryland. I'm not really sure how she got to New York, but that is where she eventually became a nurse and then a nurse anesthetist. Although she uses her, you always used her maiden name, she was married, and she did have one child, a daughter, whose name was Jerry, is it? Jerry, Jerry? Wade. Uh-huh. And she lives in New Jersey. Okay. So Yeah, and she had to come back and live with her. Mm-hmm. Periodically. Reluctantly. Yes, By I way, remember she, that. She fought the entire time until she got back to Hawaii. That's right. <laughs> I remember that. But she began her nursing career at Harlem, Harlem Hospital in 1940. You know, and she did complete a three-year diploma program at Harlem. And I read where uh, the Red Cross was always a big part of Goldie's life. Mm-hmm. And I read that uh, she started with the Red Cross when she was a student nurse because she was sent out with a tin can cup, I mean a tin cup, right, to collect money for the Red Cross when she was a nursing student, when she had time off. And so she actually worked with the Red Cross for 69 years. Oh, because that's what she did a lot of that in Hawaii. Oh, yeah. We'll get uh-huh. to that. Yeah, though. she did. And then during World War II, when hospital anesthesiologists were in World War II, nurses began to train as anesthesia nurses. And this wasn't like a formal training. It was OJT. And so she did that for a year. And she liked anesthesia. And so when all of that um, came to a close, she went to a for- to a nurse anesthesia program to become so a nurse So you're talking about just in... Harlem. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. okay. yes, mm-hmm. yes, mm-hmm. just in, in Harlem. Harlem. I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. But she did go to a formal school of anesthesia. She and two friends, though, during the war worked in, in obstetrics. God bless them. And they <laughs> helped with inductions with Averton and gas, and the two gases were nitrous oxide and oxygen in OB uh, for maintenance. And I'm not sure anyone's ever heard of Averton before. No, I haven't. Miss Foss talked to me about it one time but it's tribromoethanol is what is its chemical name is it may still be used in some laboratory experiments on rodents like 
mice and that type we of thing. We used them on pregnant women. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, well, also, that explains they, some people we see walking around. They may around. still use it uh, in birds, but they're really trying not to use it anymore. But I thought you would really enjoy this because it was administered to adults, both rectally and iv oh my but God. predominantly rectally <laughs> because they didn't really start a lot of ivs back then <laughs> okay oh my lord well we used they used to use brevital rectally right well I know that was in children sharon yeah. not in adults <laughs> pregnant adults <laughs> <laughs> well there you go i guess well while you're getting your enema back then the way they used to god bless the anesthetists of that day uh, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my goodness. My, how we've progressed. <laughs> so, um, Sandy, why don't you tell us about the barriers that Goldie faced when transitioning from mainstream nursing to nurse anesthesia education? And I'm sure they were great. Well, you know, when you think back, she was born in 1917. That was the famous Frank versus Scythe. Well, and she probably didn't know anything about that at birth. Well, but she probably didn't know anything you know, about it when she was looking at anesthesia. For all of the students or who listen to our podcast, who probably have never heard this name, I think we need to clarify the biggest barrier that Goldie had at that time. She was a woman of color. Oh yes, yes, and. I mean, that's huge. If yeah. you're born in 1917. Yes. yes. I mean, a woman and yeah. a woman of and color. Woman of color. Yes. Right. True. And it really showed, Sharon, in terms of the barriers erected and barriers overcome mm -hmm. when she decided she was going to be a nurse anesthetist, a legitimate, educated nurse anesthetist. And Goldie once said, and I quote exactly what she says, getting into school in 1946 was more than just a notion. In New York City, there was a New York Hospital School of Anesthesia for nurses. Forget it. They were not taking black people at that point. Kings County and Bellevue were city hospitals that would take black people, but the waiting list was like forever. Which End meant, quote. we'll put you on the list, That's but we're right. not letting you in. Yeah. So, um, so Goldie and her classmate, Arcelia Williams, decided to apply to anesthesia programs at two historically black colleges. Uh, Meharry Medical College and Tuskegee University. Now, Meharry, where's that at? I'm not quite sure. Google that, uh, Jeremy. And, and Tuskegee University. Yes, and that's where they did all those uh, STD trials yeah. unknowingly on all that's those black in men. Nashville. Nashville. Okay. okay. But just before the two left for the Medical College of uh, Meharry, uh, Dr. Helen Meyer, who was at Harlem, she was an Australian-born anesthesiologist, mm. told her if she stayed at Harlem Hospital, she would teach them to become nurse anesthetists, and she would help her start an anesthesia school in Harlem. Wow. And that sold it for Goldie. She said, I stayed. An offer I couldn't refuse. So, Nancy, what were the student days like for Goldie? Well, as Sandy said, she was trained by uh, Helene Mayer. And um, they were taught classroom content by Dr. Roth, and he trained foreign medical graduates to take the American boards. They worked nights at Harlem Hospital and would go to class in the daytime. They attended classes on anatomy, physiology, pharmacology, and many other subjects. Then the two of them would go back to work in the evening and teach other nurses what they had learned during the day. See one, do one, teach one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Dr. Mayo worked with them on the clinical part so they could get their clinical skills up to date. Goldie said that I really enjoyed the work. Unlike many nursing jobs, you have a beginning and an end. You put the patient to sleep and later have the satisfaction of seeing them wake up and begin the recovery process. You know, I love that quote. I had never really given that much thought. Mm -hmm. But that's exactly the beauty about anesthesia. It really is. Didn't it draw so many of us there? <laughs> yes. One patient at a time. Yes. And a mm. beginning 
and an yes. endpoint. Yeah. And, and they and don't talk can, in between. Yes. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Or at least you hope not. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Unless I tell, I'll have patients sometimes say, did I say anything? I said, well, if you do, just tell me where the money's hid. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my. So what challenges, again, Sandy, did Goldie face in establishing the Harlem Hospital School of Anesthesia? I'm sure, again, these are numerous. Yes. uh, Well, (laughs) she said in some of the research I did, when the time was right, we reached out to the AANA, and they got in touch with Florence McQuillan, who was the executive director at AANA. Uh, She told them that they had her blessings. And if they managed to get the school off the ground, sounded like she didn't think they probably Mm -hmm. could, uh, they could challenge the certification exam. And so I'm not quite sure what all that meant. They could challenge the certification exam. They meaning? Goldie. Goldie. Uh Okay. Well, I guess it's like like clepping courses now. Yeah. You could go in and take the test, and if you had the knowledge, you didn't have to Yeah, because, you know, certification didn't start until 1945. Right. So that was about the time Goldie was finishing, and and not everybody was taking that certification exam at the time. And so the certification exam was all day at that time, she said. But in 1949, her colleague, uh, Williams, and uh, Ahmaud Sims, and Goldie challenged the board certification exam and passed. Good for them. And so they've been having all those classes, and they paid off. She was given permission to open the school under the condition that it could not cost the city any money. Now, this was Harlem Hospital, mm-hmm. and it, they, they would not let it cost any money. And she said what that meant was they would get no salary other than that for bedside nursing, but undaunted the school opened in 1949. And I thought it was so interesting uh, looking at her first class. She said they consisted of an Irish Catholic girl, a Jewish boy. Uh, These were people who found it difficult to get in schools of anesthesia, either because of their race or ethnicity. Hmm. The Jewish student had a Ph.D. Hmm. She had two, two boys from the Gold Coast of Africa, one Filipino, and one Korean student. The rest of the class of 16 were a mix of Caucasian, Hispanic, and black students from New New York and New Jersey. She went on to say there wasn't too many schools at the time that admitted blacks, and this is a quote, men or students from foreign countries. We would hold dinner each week and try different foods representing one of the students' diverse ethnic background. Wow. now, at that time, you know, many schools were not even hardly a year. They were nine, nine to 12 months in length. Their program for the very beginning was 26 months because Goldie was very strong and felt that they couldn't do an adequate job with less time. Uh, wow. They had one month vacation each year. So it was a 24-month right. program, just like that's, that's just right. like the one that I went to that's when right. you were program that's director. Right. And we, you just thought you were getting something, didn't you? <laughs> I don't even think we got the month of vacation, but... No, you got two weeks. See? Two, two weeks here, two weeks... You got two, a month broken down into two weeks. That's right. Yep. Um, but she started them off with courses in mathematics and reading comprehension. Um, in her first class, all were diploma nurses, and uh, all were very patient savvy she said she always had a high degree of respect for diploma oh, nurses oh my gosh you they know, were because, amazing nurses yeah and um and she once said in some of my readings about her the school became famous because dr mayor and i both said if you're going to train nurse synesthetists to do something that physicians do not that it is medical practice for nurses to do anesthesia uh, frank versus south but the nurses will have to do it just as well or better than the physicians and that was her thought yeah well you know i whenever i still go and teach students i tell them all the time you have to be better than your physician counterparts and then i'll yeah. pick a male and a female sitting side by side and i'll say and she has to be better than you yeah and that's the truth because still it, it's changing but even whenever i first started giving anesthesia predominantly all the surgeons are male and a male surgeon will say something to a female anesthetist he would never say to a male 
He yeah. would ne- it, because you know the males will go into the locker room and he's still afraid that somebody is <laughs> going cold cock him. Yeah. Or in the parking lot, and so female CRNAs have to be better than their male counterparts and the physician counterparts. Well, it's, it's still interesting to me the timing of all of this. I mean, it's the time period here that we're talking about. Is vastly different than mm-hmm. we are today. Before civil rights, yeah, think right. about it. Oh yeah, before the '60s and civil rights, there were restrooms for people of color and whites, water yeah. fountains for people of color and whites, and uh, and she stayed almost her whole career as a nurse anesthetist in Harlem. Yeah, and she really overcame many barriers and really educated a lot of people that have done great jobs. Henry Talley was mm-hmm. one, for oh, example. I didn't, yeah. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. you need to listen to huh. Henry, uh, Henry, tell, Henry tell his story. There was an article I found in putting this together on minority nurses, and they had interviewed Henry, and he said, and he was from the Bronx, mm-hmm. but he ended up at the Harlem Hospital. He came in and asked Goldie. He said he never would forget her looking over those glasses when he said, I think I want to be a nurse anesthetist. And she said, do you know what a nurse anesthetist is? Well, he really didn't a whole lot. <laughs> and he said, come back and talk to me when you figure out what it is. Mm. And so he, She's a tough we, we didn't have internets. We didn't have Google. We didn't have any of that stuff. But Henry went and he researched in the library and he found out what it was and came back. And he said the greatest mentor he mm-hmm. ever had was Goldie Bryant. You need to hear yeah, Henry yeah. tell some yeah. of his stories. I haven't heard his story, but, you know, I'm just thinking of this. At this time, a male... A black male Mm -hmm. going into nurse anesthesia, what an anomaly Mm -hmm. that had to be. Oh, there's even more to the story. For those of you who don't know Henry Talley, I first met Henry Talley. We got uh, elected to the AANA Board of Directors at the same time, and I never knew Henry uh, before then because he was an educator. He was the director of the program at Michigan State, and so usually, you know, Clinical uh, anesthetists and people who are in academia don't typically see each other. Our right. meetings are separate. Um, so I got to know Henry very well. And we were the only breakfast eaters on the board. And so he and I would meet for breakfast every single morning. And mm-hmm. I learned a tremendous amount. Yeah. And, and uh, Henry now is doctorally prepared. Mm-hmm. Yep. And, he's, and retired. Yeah. Yes. And he's, <laughs> he's, uh, he's directed several programs. He's yeah. authored chapters and books. Uh, really a phenomenal yeah, uh, example of what a nurse anesthetist can and should be. I think. Uh, and and his story from where he came from, it's his story to tell, yeah. but uh, it's a its a story. Yeah. But anyway, uh, Goldie went on and served as director of that program from its opening in 1949 until her retirement in 1985. So she directed years? that program. God, and I was, wow. man, I was 24, and I thought that was something. But 38 years. Wow. Um during that time, she estimated that she graduated at least seven to 750 students. She once said, sometimes we would start out with 20 students and end up with 16. We did not keep a student if we had any doubt about his or her ability, she said. She also attributed the popularity of her program to the fact that at the time, it was one of the few programs in the nation that taught regional anesthesia. So that it, was very forward. It, and so that was in the 50s and 60s, mm-hmm. you know, not not many programs. I mean, we weren't taught regional anesthesia mm-hmm. when I was at Wake, Wake Forest in the late 60s. Right. And it's been it's been hard, especially for epidurals mm-hmm. uh, even now. But anyway, that was a, a selling point for her program. Wow. So, Nancy, talk to us about her professional service to uh, the state and national associations. Well, can I interject something? Because I think I figured out why they had to challenge the qualifying exam. Tell us. Their school wasn't a school. When they were taught at Harlem, they were taught by Dr. Mayer and the the one who taught classes Mm -hmm. so it was but there weren't any accredited programs then no because this started in 49 and accreditation started till 52 it wasn't a it wasn't a real program they were the only two students and they were the first students and i don't know that any more came until she started that program so i think that they had to challenge the qualifying exam because when they went for accreditation for the Harlem program, they would not be acceptable nurse anesthetist. Because they hadn't taken the qualifying exam. Because they hadn't exam. taken the qualifying exam. I think that's well, what it was. And it was about the time that the qualifying exam was being mm-hmm. introduced. 
And I remember Lillian Stansfield Smith, who started the program here at Wake, said one of the uh, hardest jobs was to convince nurse anesthetists that they needed to take the exam Mm -hmm. uh, because it wasn't something that everybody wanted or did do. That's right. Yeah. That's true. But anyway, she served as president of the New York Association of Nurse Anesthetists in 1959. And I will tell you from talking with my friends, my CRNA friends from New York, particularly uh, Denny Sheridan, Martin Sheridan, Mm -hmm. Goldie was a mentor to more than just the ones at Harlem. I never, ever spoke to any of the members of the New York Association that did not hold Goldie up That's correct. as a very, very special person and someone who had taught them something along the way. So, and she held many offices in the AANA. Now, treasurer at this time was not a member of the board, but she was the treasurer from 1967 to 1969. She was vice president from 71 to 72, president-elect from 72 to 73, and then president 73, 74. And, of course, she was the first and so far the only African-American AA president that we've had. Um, Now, when she was treasurer, the person who ran the, I I don't think she was called a CEO. I don't know what she was called. Executive director. Executive director. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was Miss McQuillan. The Iron Lady. uh The Iron Lady. She was the Iron Lady. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And Goldie used to talk about being president. She was made to sit out in the hall. Treasure. Treasure, excuse mm-hmm. me. Um, she was made to sit out in the hall. During and, board meetings? Yeah, because she wasn't a member of the board. Until Miss McQuillan called her in and handed her the treasurer's report that she was going to read to the board. So she sat that out That McQuillan there, had written. That McQuillan oh. had written. <laughs> she, As treasurer, she had absolutely no idea nope. what the assets of the AANA were. Oh, were. Wow. But that and, was for all treasurers. Yeah. Because of under Mc, Under McQuillan, under yes. Ma- uh-huh. Oh, yes. Yeah. Really? And then oh, when yeah. she finished her report, she went back outside, outside and sat, sat in the oh. chair. And she knitted. That's what she did. She'd sit out there and knit until it was time for her to go in and read McQuillan's treasury report. But that was wow. that was Mac. I mean, that's yes. how she was. Um, she was something else. So why don't you both talk a little bit about some of her accomplishments as president? Because there was a great many okay Uh, i think one of the things that stands out as i uh, look back over uh, her time as president she improved communication among ana and its members the public legislators and other health care organizations now you've got to put it in the context of of where we are we had had florence mcquillan as the executive director for many many years she was known as the iron lady she was very autocratic. Nobody really had an idea or did anything except her. Mm -hmm. Hmm. And and that included the board members as well. She wrote their reports too. Wow. And they read them. And um, so it was about time to end that. And in fact, Ms. McQuillan retired the year Goldie was president in 1974 and i don't know was that a planned retirement i don't i don't not know that, now listen now that may have been to a, find out that, some dirt <laughs> I, I think it was with great duress okay and you know one of the reasons now let's get back to this florence mcquillan would not fly on a plane and until 1974 all the meetings had been held with american hospital association uh, in, in chicago, chicago. Uh-huh. Yep. Okay. but go. now they were going to sprout their wings and fly they were going mm-hmm. to see the country they're going to mm-hmm. have these meetings other places and in so doing what are they going to do with florence she ain't going to fly mm-hmm. and um so it was time you know and in fact it was time right and um but and I've heard so many stories, and I'm going to tell one about Florence McQuillan. It was told to me by Jenny Gaffey, who was a former president of uh, or past president of ANA. And she said they were downtown Chicago. The whole the board was there, and they were all out to dinner. And um, the waiters came and gave them water and crackers, but then they didn't come back for a long, long time. And everybody smoked then. You can see right. it. Everybody yeah. smoking, and they yeah. had the ashtrays, and they had the water, and they had the crackers. And Florence got really aggravated, and she said, 
let me have those packages from these crackers. And she put them all in the ashtray and set them on fire. And, <laughs> what? Yeah, she put them all in the ashtray and set them on fire. And then they had all the waiters and waitresses there <laughs> that were helping them out, seeing, seeing what they could do. And um, she also was one that moved the money with the board's approval, which she insisted on, to another <laughs> bank uh, because they paid more interest. And um, Florence always wore, like me, black and she had this hat. She had her own um, her own taxi cab driver, uh, and he would come and get her and take her everywhere she went. And she was at the bank, and um, the man that owned the bank asked her if she could stand in the alcove waiting for a taxi because her image basically wasn't good for the clientele of his bank. Oh, wow. She went back the next day and took all of the money. Oh, yeah. Bad day. <laughs> <laughs> By the time she, she walked did. out there, he was on his knees, and she <laughs> said, if I'm not good enough to stand in front of your bank, you're not good enough to have my organization's money. There you period. go. But we're going to get off of the um, floor. But you can see it was at this time the break, and that's why communication and putting this organization on a more business front. Yeah with all the people doing their job, not one person. Right. Mm-hmm. It was a breaking point. When you put it all together, that's where it was. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. As Sandy mentioned, uh, well, I don't know whether you know this or not, but I don't think anybody said it so far, but Goldie had two master's degrees. She had a master in education. She had a, uh, an MBA as well. Wow. And that so, was pretty uh, innovative uh, back then. She was... Um, even now, <laughs> uh, she's the one who created a business structure for our national association. You know, she implemented job descriptions. She had financial managers, employment plans, and also establishment of the executive committee. And I think it was also under Goldie that the treasurer became a member of the board. I'm not sure of that. That would make sense but if I, I think, had to sit out in the I, hall and knit. <laughs> yeah. that she was the one who did that, and it was a two-year uh, appointment, which it stayed for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, she, she was very, very instrumental in opening it up and not so many things being secretive and all in one person's hands. The other thing, as president, she saw the modernization of the ANA annual meeting, including um, concurrent lectures, uh, refresher courses, and special activities, as well as lectures for students. Uh, She also streamlined the uh, annual business meeting uh, with distribution of committee reports and other important information in written form so that the business meetings didn't last forever and a day. And she was a champion, as you know, from her directorship at the Harlem uh, School in, uh, of Nurse Anesthesia Education. And she introduced workshops on quality assurance and helped write the ANA Quality Assurance Manual. Wow. And going back to having all the reports, you know, there's an annual report. We used to print it and have it at the business meeting. Of course, it's digital now, I would suppose. But they would those booklets would be sitting mm-hmm. outside of the business meeting and whenever we've been doing the courage to lead series and some of the presidents that we've interviewed that have been a number of years back well, I've told them go back and get your annual report because some things you forget mm-hmm. after a while that happened so and all that started with Goldie yep she also introduced workshops uh, in, on local and regional anesthesia at the annual meeting and was one of the first to teach regional anesthesia techniques in her anesthesia program, which we've already mentioned. And she also went to many state associations and then came back to ANA meetings to facilitate the teaching of regional anesthesia. You know, and I read again in that Minority Nurses uh, publication about her. Now, she was going out to these meetings in the late 60s, mm-hmm. early 70s, and she came to our state association. Mm-hmm. I remember she had bad laryngitis i remember when she was uh trying to speak here and had quite the time of it but in her eyes she went to these meetings of ours and all she saw was a sea of white faces sure Mm. nobody looked like her and remember this was a woman that not only you know did what she did at harlem hospital but but she she also um came up as a child of the civil rights 
she lived through all of that, you know, well, in the 60s, and because she was already a nurse anesthetist by that time. Mm-hmm. Well, going back to Henry Talley, whenever we were on the board together, usually during open forums back then, only the president was at the front, mm-hmm. um, and Henry went to Paul Santoro, who was the first president I served under on a, on the board of directors, and said, could the whole board be up on the head table for these open forums because I want students of color to see me up here because they don't see anybody that looks like me. And so... Uh, to Paul's credit, he said, yes, that's a great idea. Mm-hmm. And so if you notice during Paul Santoro's year, I also did it too, um, had the entire board because people don't know who their board members are. Everybody's doing it now, are they? Um, I hope uh, so. Until, until the last meeting that we right. had. Yeah. I hope so. But the whole board is up there. I'm not talking about the business meeting. I'm talking about open forums oh, okay. 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 Um, where the okay. president's gotcha. up there and answering questions. Mm-hmm. So I always put my whole board up there too. Mm-hmm. But yeah. Henry was right. He said, I want, the, I mm-hmm. want them to know that this is possible. And we've talked about it was at uh, under her leadership at her meeting that there was uh, voted to discontinue holding the annual meeting in conjunction with American Hospital Association. And that probably led to a more hasty retirement of mm-hmm. Florence McQuillan as well. Goldie was the first ANA president to have a theme for their year. And her theme was year of communication because there had really been very little right. communication. <laughs> I mean, there was, but it was one person. <laughs> but I mean, really and truly there was it was really a closed shop. Mm-hmm. And Goldie realized that he, at that time when you go back and read Thatcher and some of the history books, the, the members were very apathetic. I mean, they they didn't feel like they belonged. And so that was one of her big concerns. So she did try very, very hard to make communication more effective between AANA and its members, the public, legislators, and other health care organizations. I'm wondering when we got rid of the themed years. Um, I'm trying to remember. It's been a while because it wasn't, they didn't have themed years whenever I was, I was on the board. And that was 2010 when I was first elected. So that's been 11 years ago. And they had stopped for a while. Um, and I guess it's because if you've got your idea, then you're not carrying over. There's no continuity in the plan. So I think it started happening just a couple of years before I got on the board. Well, even when we had a theme, it was what it was. It was what it you was. know, uh, what was direct, your theme? Uh, strength through unity, mm-hmm. I think. And that's. <laughs> Scott uh, Gray came behind me, and I've forgotten what his was. Something like, it's straight through. It was very opposite of that. Right. You know, I can't remember the exact words. Nancy, do you remember yours? Uh-uh. I don't. But, well. um, but very few of us really were able to implement what we wanted to do as president. Oh, well, you, who you is? End up, you <laughs> with end what up you get. with what you get. Uh-huh. And, uh, for example, direct reimbursement was seven years. Mm-hmm. And it was a top priority for seven years, wow. four years of legislation and three years of regulation through seven presidents and 77 board members. Mm-hmm. And uh, so you can have all these good ideas. And it's probably the oh, same. Well, now. And it's seven. God's number. You hear that? Seven <laughs> years, 77 <laughs> yeah. board members. Yeah, I mean, it, it, <laughs> it was sounds like politics in general. Right? <laughs> yeah. I mean. yeah. Yeah. So anyway, um, in Watchful Care 1, uh, sort of to the back of the book, they have all the presidents listed from Agatha Hodgins all the way to my presidency in 1989 because that's when that book ended. And each president, there's a little statement, a little little few sentences mm-hmm. uh, that sort of demarcate them in terms of what they were looking at. And Goldie said, an effective organization continually looks for ways to involve members in the development of plans, policies, and procedures on a year-round basis because through participation comes understanding, and members can then, as a rule, wholeheartedly support the interim and actions of their board. And I couldn't agree more. And I think Jim Walker uh, refined this statement when he was president in, I guess, what, Sharon, 2010? No, no, he was he was way before that, because Jackie was after him. Okay, but anyway, he, he also 
Uh, no, Jackie was before him. Yes, I, think I it was, was. I was government relations chair for Jim. I think it was two thousand and eight. Yeah, I thought it was two and ten because that's when that articles came out during his year of no mm-hmm. harm fine mm-hmm. and also the economic piece. And I thought I'll have to look it up. But anyway, he found that, and I, and it all started I think because of where Goldie found herself. You know, with the executive director and 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 the barriers she'd had to overcome. But it certainly rings clear for today as well. If we don't involve the members and find ways to get them involved, they're not going to be interested. You know, you're more interested in doing what you have a piece of. Mm-hmm. Um, and we need ownership. to ownership. Ownership, and we need to revisit that. I think as an organization. Well, um, let's talk about whenever she helped save Martin Luther King's life. You knew about that, didn't you? Jimmy? Yeah, I did. On September 20th, 1958, was when um, Dr. Martin Luther King, an assassination attempt was made on his life. And he was doing a book signing, his book, Stride Toward Freedom, Birth of the Civil Rights Movement. He was doing a book signing on that particular book. And a 42-year-old woman, who was later to, found to be mentally ill, uh, stabbed him in the chest with a fairly long, sharp letter opener. Wow. Seven and, inches. Yeah. That's long. a long wow. letter <laughs> opener. Um, and so they took him to Harlem. Isn't that right, Sandy? Yes. It yes. was Harlem. It was closest it? hospital. Yeah. Uh, and he was going to have to have an emergency thoracotomy to remove this um, uh, letter opener. Thankfully, nobody pulled it out. Um, but the New York governor was six weeks from re-election, and he wanted Dr. King moved to Columbia Presbyterian or Mount Sinai for surgery. Um, but the chief of surgery at Harlem and the chief of vascular surgery convinced him that it would really be very dangerous to move Dr. King, which it probably would because Goldie, you know, said you could just see the Every time he took a breath, it was moving. And this particular New York governor, who was running for re-election, really needed the black vote to be re-elected. And so... And he didn't want anything to happen no, to Dr. King. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so Politics he, um, are intersecting again. Yep. was finally <laughs> convinced that it was best to leave Dr. King there at Harlem and not move him Mm -hmm. because he also did not need anything to happen to dr king either because he decided to move him Mm -hmm. you know so goldie said when dr king arrived in the or it was a little less turmoil than what had been around him in the emergency room but she said one time she still to this day couldn't understand why they allowed so many people in the operating room. Now, this was 1958. Can you imagine what a zoo you can. that probably oh, was? Yeah. And by the way, for those that want to get a full description of this, Evan Coe did an interview with her, and uh, it's a published article in the Journal of AANA, December 2015, mm-hmm. I believe. And uh, that's where I find some of these details. And um, so the surgery consisted uh, of removing that 7-inch letter opener from Dr. King's chest, and they had to make two incisions, one intercostal and and one vertical, and it made a cross, you know, shaped scar that Dr. King would really joke about for the rest of his life. They had to remove two ribs and the manubrium of the sternum. Uh, The tip of the letter opener was dangerously close to and between the anominate artery and the aorta, and Goldie said that with every breath... That blade moved oh, every wow. time he breathed. It was closer and closer to the dominant artery and the aorta. Wow! And um, so it was uh, in 1958. That was a big operation to figure out how to back this thing up. This this letter opener. Yeah. As far as anesthesia for Dr. King, Dr. Helene Mayer that we've already talked about, the Austrian Austrian born anesthesia. Anesthesiologists began the anesthesia. Still hard for you to say that term, right, Nancy? (laughs) (laughs) Methodist. Just remember Methodist. Um, It would, the anesthesia that they used was called the GOE technique. And it was delivered through a Hyde Brink machine. And I've only seen a Hyde Brink machine like in a history demonstration. 
but the um, GOE meant gas, nitrous oxide, which was nitrous oxide, oxygen, and ether. And uh, it, was, it was called the blended technique, and it was developed in 1939. And so the way it worked was they gave the oxygen and the nitrous oxide, and then they would add small amounts of ether uh, for relaxation and to control the depth of anesthesia. Now, ether was an unbelievable neuromuscular relaxant. You did not use any type of muscle relaxant with ether. So that was its role at that point in time, as well as to give amnesia, because I guess even then nitrous oxide wasn't enough to... Let me ask you guys a question. Um, Did either of y'all even get to... Do ether? Oh, yeah, we had to. Okay. In Um, 1967 to 69, you had to do one or two ether cases. Because Miss Bunn, who gave me, she gave me her ether mask, and I have a, I have a shadow box, but she had ether hooks, and she said you had to put it in the corner of their mouths to drain the saliva out because they would salivate a lot. Oh, yeah. So so that's true. Mm -hmm. The Mm -hmm. cases I used ether with, I did use it in the tracheal tube. Okay. I remember one was a small infant for a repair of cleft lip, and I don't know, think I was using my ether very good because he got so light during the procedure, he spit the endotracheal tube out. Ooh. However, ether sort of stimulates respiration, so that was a good thing. Yeah. The baby was still <laughs> breathing. That's good. And another was uh, a GYN, I think it might have been abdominal hysterectomy, and I used um, ether, you know, check that box. I've done my two, but I also used a gram of a nectine drip. So oh, yes. call it. So you could tell I wasn't using my ether very much, <laughs> <laughs> if at all. I still did. We, you still had us. We did a lot of uh, suck strips. Yeah, yeah. So, I was even in school. But that was a lot of suck strip. Yeah, that was a lot of suck strip. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Well, in the 1950s, they did not use mechanical ventilation. And as I said, they didn't use paralytics. So um, Goldie said, you bag them in those days. You could sense respiratory changes like compliance that way. Monitors included manual blood pressure and looking, listening, and feeling. You had your hand on the patient the entire time. And we didn't have... When I first started anesthesia school, there were no ventilators in the operating room. Mm -hmm. And then, ultimately, there was one in each of the heart rooms. But basically, we grew up knowing when to give muscle relaxant, just like Goldie did. And it is really true. If you hand ventilate them, you Mm -hmm. can feel the difference in compliance and when to give your muscle relaxant. Because we didn't have any neuromuscular stimulators or anything like that. You know why, Nancy? We didn't have them for so many, many years at Wake Forest, ventilators in the operating room. Mm-hmm. We were petrified of an unrecognized disconnect yeah, because in a paralyzed had patient. Mm-hmm. We had no pulse oximetry. We had no end tidal CO2. And that was a real reason. Mm-hmm. And I think that a lot of people could have been harmed sure. until we mm-hmm. got some of these other things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Keep it. Well, so I can drink. remember the end tidal CO2. Her name was Sarah, and she took a whole room right and you were only sampled at as many ors as you had so we had what 20 mm-hmm. ors mm-hmm. so you were only sampled it would only sample one at a time mm-hmm. so you would intubate somebody and you still wouldn't know if you had end tidal until your room got sampled i would forgotten that sharon yeah. but you're absolutely right yes yeah. but yeah. that machine the end tidal took an entire room and her name was sarah and it was <laughs> i mean which wow. is so odd to think about it now. So yeah. when it when they said bag, you mean ambu bag, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah with your yeah. hand. You're impressed. You're impressed by that knowledge, aren't you? Shane? What was called? Isn't yeah, it? I, am, I know that. I, I am impressed. That. Well, it's not really an ambu bag. It's, no, it's the it's bag. The bag on the, the machine. machine. It's oh, the machine. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. But if you look at a lot of older anesthetists, um, like my Miss Barbara, her finger was actually bent. Her index finger from holding. Up underneath the chins, oh. holding their airways uh-huh. up. Now, 
So hey, Sarah does that to me at night. She's well, like, "You're snoring." She she said, she'll wake me up sometimes, and she'll wake me up. She'll be pushing. She'll up be pushing hard. On your chin. She goes, "You're snoring. Can you stop?" Yeah, I'm, I'm telling like, what you. What the heck are you doing, Jeremy? The worst thing in the world for a nurse anesthetist is to have a spouse that obstructs oh, all their is. airway. Yes, yeah. it is. Oh, I've, I've helped Pierce's yeah. airway, but yeah. let me tell you something about Miss Spun. Now she had had a stroke. She couldn't say my name. She knew who I was. She would call me Marie. And I'm sitting at the rest home with her, and this lady goes by outside the room, and she's got her walker, and she is severely kyphotic. Oh, my God. And Barbara and I watch her walk by the room, and then Barbara turns around and looks at me and says, bad airway. <laughs> I mean, she can't speak my name. She can't speak anything else, but wow. that was in was her. Yeah. She was bad airway and all i could do was laugh because i had watched the lady and i'm thinking oh my god if i had to put a tube in her <laughs> so funny we digress but anyway once they t- did get um the knife removed dr mayor stood up and goldie sat down so goldie finished the anesthesia on dr king uh wow. goldie had a tremendous respect for this dr mayor And she said, with seven CRNAs and 16 students, we did everything that came through the door, including trauma and hearts, she recalled. Um, She said, Harlem, this is funny. She said, Harlem had a new anesthesia, or never never had a new anesthesia machine. And then she also said that Dr. Mayer treated CRNAs and anesthesiologists as equals. If you were an anesthetist, you were an anesthetist. At Harlem, there were no second-class anesthesia. She obviously she, wasn't from the U.S., right? She was She's from Australia. Austria. Austria. Yeah, that's what and I mean. Austria. Austria. <laughs> Austria. I thought it was Australia. Austria. 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 Anyway, um, you know, and well, they do have nurse anesthetists there more than they do Australia. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, she said that they never owned a new anesthesia machine. But when they would get one that was due to them, Dr. Mayer would very quickly do an anesthetic on it so nobody else would take it away from them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, when you look at uh, this one moment in time with um, the emergency surgery on Dr. King, uh, being in 1958, he was 29 years old. Oh, wow. And he was four years into his campaign. Uh, we had lost him that day. If they had, what would have happened wow. to the whole civil rights era? And uh, a surgeon on the case has said, if we had lost him, the whole civil rights era could have been different. Mm. And um, we know that Dr. King was assassinated a decade later. And by then, Congress had passed both the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And uh, when I think of Dr. King, I think of three people, him and two others like him. I think of Gandhi, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think of Nelson Mandela, Mm -hmm. and I think of Dr. King. They pushed their point through peace, you know, and not violence, and uh, a lot to be learned today. We need another Dr. King. We certainly do, or people like any of the three of them uh, to move us forward. So Goldie retired in 85, but she didn't move to Hawaii until 87. When she was in Hawaii, she worked as a health consultant to the Hawaii chapter of American Red Cross, where she was one of 14 national faculty members for HIV education. She was named a Red Cross Volunteer Hero in 2018 for her work as an educator and her classes in HIV, AIDS, first aid, CPR, child care, babysitting, and nurse assistant training. She traveled to neighborhood islands to train 52 registered nurses and served as a shelter manager in Kauai during Hurricane um, Aniki. Aniki. Uh There was another one, too, and I can't remember its name, that she also did the same thing. But in this particular hurricane, uh, she worked where they were housing 2,000 residents and tourist and a goose and a goose i hope it laid a golden, golden egg, egg. <laughs> <laughs> she also served on the hawaii um red cross board of directors and I, I think now she was a forceful woman for 102 years until the wow. day of her death and wow. at one time her only child jerry brought her back 
to Montclair, New Jersey, mm-hmm. because then Goldie was, I don't know how old, she was in her 90s, yes. 95, 97, 98, something like that. And you can imagine for poor Jerry, with mother that age being in Hawaii, yeah. and she's in New Jersey, and, and she brought her home, and Goldie never had a happy moment mm-hmm. in New Jersey. And finally, she won, and she got to go back to her beloved Hawaii. And... um. And that's where she was, I think, when she died. So I'm sure she had some awards, too. Yeah. Um, she, what did she have? Uh, in 1983, she received the ANA's fourth um, Helen Lamb Outstanding Educator Award. And certainly 38 years as program director in Harlem. Good yeah. God. And in 1994, uh, she was awarded the ANA's highest honor, which is the Agatha Hodgins Award for Outstanding Accomplishments. You know, back to going back to whenever I asked you about Gertrude Fife and you said, well, I, I was probably there, but I don't remember. I was at that meeting in 1994, and I don't remember that. Mm-hmm. I don't remember her getting yeah. the award. Yep. So I understand what you're saying. Yep. Sandy, how long were you the director at Wake? 24 years. 24 years. Yeah, from 1982 to 2005. Wow. But I was employed there for... Um, about 35 years. 35 yeah. years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You went to school there and then stayed. Yeah, and as a clinical uh, clinical anesthetist, I said I was going to stay there until something better came along. And, uh, <laughs> and nothing never ever did. Yeah, did I it. saw anything better come <laughs> along, you know. And uh, So, anyway. Well, as we kind of close here, any closing thoughts from each of you about Goldie and uh, her life? Well, I remember Goldie um, as being... An extremely smart woman, but she also was one of the nicest people I think I've ever been around. Um, she had a good business mind. She was highly, highly thought of. I mean, she just was. And one of the things that's not mentioned in what we said today is that one of the things that that Goldie did was she spoke a lot on how to anesthetize people who were substance abusers. Mm. Um, and that was the first thing that I ever heard Goldie talk about. Can you well, the imagine? The first le- lecture that I ever heard her do was uh, anesthesia for the substance abuser. And being the naive person that I was, I thought this, the lecture was extremely interesting, but it wasn't something that I was ever going to have to deal with. Oh, Lord. <laughs> that was a New York thing. My, how the world time. has changed. I know, but that was at that time. It Can you was, imagine what that must have been like in Harlem? Oh, and, gosh. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but that yeah. was something that you thought about. It only we didn't know anything about that at that time. Right. And but um, Goldie certainly did, mm-hmm. and uh, so she was, as far as I know, the first CRNA that I I think ever really lectured on that as far as meetings and stuff like that were concerned. She was, as I mentioned earlier, very well thought of by New York State, and there is a Goldie Brang, uh, Brangman Award, and it's it is. Um, awarded to a student each year and there's criteria which includes um an essay now did she remain friends with martin luther king and their family or was there ever any contact after that do you know i do not know Hmm. i I, I never heard her say and i didn't see it in any of the writings about her Mm mm-hmm but oh, well, she, she was the face behind the mask you probably never (laughs) even knew she was there that's right yeah that's right but um Anyway, for, for me, in terms of closing thought, I think that um, that she should be the wind beneath the wings of our minority um, CRNAs mm-hmm. today. She remains the only um, Afro-American president this organization has ever had, and we will soon be 100 years old. There's still time before that 100th anniversary mm-hmm. for someone to emulate Goldie and move forward and do the things that Goldie did. And if she can do it, we have a lot of members out there today that can do the same thing. And I've talked to a few who were on the board, a few um, African-Americans, but they didn't they didn't go on beyond directors, right. and, you know. And I would really like to see this happen again. And um, so, you know, have courage, use her as your mentor, and move forward. Oh, I think can that's... I say one last thing? I mentioned that Goldie was quiet she was a quite calm person and when i think of her i think of a person who walks softly but carries a big stick and 
that really got Goldie um, really a long way. But that's how she was. She didn't. She did wasn't um, a loud person at the microphone, persistent. or she was persistent. <laughs> but you know, she was a very. As far as when I think about Dr. King and Sandy said he was such a peaceful man, that's how I s- always saw Goldie. She was always a peaceful lady, and she was a lady. Mm-hmm. Well, I can't think of a better thing to end on. I think not. So, well, Sharon, I think it's a wrap. I think so. First, I want to thank Sandy and Nancy for being here and uh, giving us this knowledge and your knowledge and sharing with our listeners. And we want to thank our listeners for listening to Beyond the Mass with Jeremy Stanley and Sharon Pierce. If you like our show and want to know more, check out our other episodes. You know, the single best way to help our show grow, Sharon, is to like us, subscribe to us, and tell all your friends and share it on social media. There you go. I like that because we're in the top 50 medical podcasts and we want to be in the top 10 at least. You keep getting that wrong. I know. We want to be number one. Well, of course, but you got to go past 10 to get to one. That is true. I think the money guy, the numbers (laughs) guy should know that. Uh, All right. Until next time. It's a wrap. Today's show was made possible by the folks at CRNA Financial Planning, an independent consulting firm that offers financial planning services exclusively to CRNAs and their families. From planning for a child's future college expenses to building a predictable income stream in retirement, the firm is committed to offering you comprehensive financial services, customized to fit your unique needs and objectives. If you have questions about your financial future, get them answered. Call the team at 855-304-3748. That's 855-304-3748. Or go online to crnafinancialplanning.com. And thanks for your support of Beyond the Mask. Hi, this is Jackie Rolls, president of the International Federation of Nurse Anesthetists and president and founder of Our Hearts, Your Hands, a global anesthesia support community that takes donations to allow nurse anesthetists in low and middle income countries to go to educational programs, buy equipment or textbooks. Your donations are tax deductible and we would appreciate your support. OSA EMR is a free anesthesia EMR developed by CRNAs that you can download and use on an iPad. Our nonprofit mission is to make sure that solo and small practice CRNAs can digitally record their anesthetics. To learn more, visit OSAEMR.com to download and consider donating to our cause. Remember, for CRNAs, data is destiny. Like what you're hearing? Be sure to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and anywhere you like to listen to shows. Also, be sure to check out BeyondTheMaskPodcast.com. Each episode is posted there with a corresponding blog post, and we timestamp important parts of the episode to help you quickly get to the content you're looking for. Also, check out the special series section on the site. You can follow along and catch up on the CRNA History Series, episodes specifically about political conversations in the industry, or try the CRNA Personal Finance Series. It's all on beyondthemaskpodcast.com. And if you have a question for the show or want to be a guest or even suggest a particular topic, fill out the contact form on the site or send an email directly to us at info at beyondthemaskpodcast.com. And lastly, let's take the conversation social. Check out our Beyond the Mask podcast Facebook page and Facebook group.